tap, tap, tap. Was the sound on the window of the house in the neighborhood that was supposed to be safe, creating the first set of fingerprints on the outside of the glass from the alley that was dirty, filled with garbage and weeds and waste and him, pacing up and down, back and forth, all night, while everyone rests and sleeps and dreams. Tap, tap, tap is what my little sister and I heard over the hum of the television, the glow of the nightlight, the stillness of security, freezing our bones, calling to attention the light, thin hairs on our soft bodies, stunting our organs, squeezing our guts, pure fear in the fortress of peace. Tap, tap, tap. We turned to see a man staring in at us. The window was high up, but he filled the entire frame. Long, wiry hair, balding on top, dusty wrinkles scarring his cheeks and forehead, crooked glasses over prying eyes. He was breathing heavily onto the glass, creating a mini mushroom cloud of condensation, hot and wet, appearing and disappearing, a fast healing wound. Our eyes met his for just a moment, a flash of penetration, his leering gaze full of blood and cum and desperation and control held us paralyzed and then released. The house filled with the pitter-patter of our tiny feet, normally reserved for playtime, frantically running past barely locked doors and open windows to the master bedroom where mom and dad had been jolted awake by terrified cries bouncing through the halls and off the ceiling the rabid electricity of threat. I usually took care of my sister, but as we ran from those wide open, bloodshot eyes, all I could think of was escape. It was the first time I was truly afraid. Our parents lied to our faces and we believed them. Everything's okay. It was probably just an accident. There's nothing to worry about. Comfort is short-lived. Embrace is temporary, damage is done. This happened when I was 10 years old. We had just moved into our upper middle class West Texas suburb. The block meeting the neighbors held was for us to tell us what they knew, which wasn't much. The alley man had visited once before to several houses, but only the families living on the west side of the street. It started with the lights. Every once in a while, many of the outside garage and porch lights would turn off, not because they had burned out, because they'd been unscrewed. This was just the beginning of what we began to happen every few months. One woman found a chair sitting right in front of her bathroom window next to a giant pile of cigarette butts and beer bottles. One morning, pages of pornography papered backyards and danced in the wind around swing sets and into pools. One night, after everyone had left bags of used clothing to be picked up for donation, he emptied them, burned holes into the chests and crotches of dresses and pants, and hung them from the trees in our front yards. But he'd never tried to break in or hurt anyone. Every time a neighbor would call the cops to report this behavior, the police would say there's nothing they could do. He would have to be caught in the act, but his visits were so sporadic there's no way to know when he'd be back. Several weeks later, Dad was coming home one night after a long day at work. As he was pulling into the driveway, he came to a screeching halt. Someone was standing there. Dad was so surprised, he didn't even realize who it was, and by the time he did, it was too late to report it or try to find him, and there was no way to know when he'd return. Thud, thud, thud. Shook the walls of my sister's bedroom, which was right on the other side of the alley. She thought it was me, messing with her, pulling a prank. But when she looked in, I was still sleeping. She went slowly back into her room and it got louder. She leaned over just enough to see out into the alley and there he was, standing with her window screen in one hand and a knife in the other. Her scream woke me up, but this time the fear felt familiar, like a language of learned behavior. We exploded into the hallway and into our parents' arms again, 
they had heard the pounding from the other side of the house. He wasn't just watching anymore. All of the screens on the alley side windows were slashed. Others had experienced a similar disturbance and this was finally enough to get the city to install big bright lights down the alley. Bars were placed on everyone's windows and for a while he was gone. Tap, tap, tap. It was a couple years later. I was watching television, laying on the same couch in the same back room where I first laid eyes on him. Tap, tap, tap. I couldn't move. My stomach turned. The sounds from the TV went mute, and all I could hear was skin on glass. Heavy breathing, heart pounding, trembling. Maybe it's the wind. But his hand hit harder each time, ticking like the timer on a bomb building to an explosion. Fear could only do so much to keep me from giving into this panicked curiosity by forcing myself to look to confirm it was real, that it was really him, that he was really back. I sat up to see him. We made eye contact for one sharp inhale before he finished turning to walk away. At least my eyes told me he walked. My brain told me he floated. He looked sicker, less human, thinner, dirtier, longer hair, like a decomposing corpse. This time I didn't run. I was supposed to be a man but was reminded of my youth and my complete inability to get his twisted face out of my head. I was shaking as I woke up my dad. He called a neighbor who was comforting his crying girls. They thought the alley man was trying to get into their bedrooms. I sat quietly in the back seat as dad drove our neighbor, armed with a baseball bat, up and down the streets looking for him. They had called the police who were also patrolling. I thought back to the summer of our first encounter. That next morning, my sister and I, as curious as we were afraid, walked around the front of the street to the end of the alley. We looked down to see a man putting something in a dumpster. It surely wasn't the alley man, but in, at the time, in our young minds, it was. He was so far down the alley, I couldn't even make out what I was seeing, just a big, dark, shadowy figure. So that is what I started looking for. But dad slammed on the brakes and our neighbor jumped out of the front seat, chasing the real alley man into the black shade of the giant trees that lined the sidewalk. We waited, ready to help or run or call the cops again, until our neighbor returned, alone, out of breath and disoriented. He said, I know this sounds crazy, but I swear to God he just disappeared, vanished right in front of me. Maybe he had floated away from my window. I grabbed Dad's hand. He squeezed. I let go. Be a man. Dad bent down and said, he's gone now. Let's go home. We'll take care of it tomorrow. And again, I believed him. Mom still credits the next block meeting as one of the most surreal things she's ever experienced. Kids weren't allowed at this one. Once sane, polite members of upper middle class suburbia were reduced to scared villagers in the wake of a witch hunt. It was quiet until someone suggested starting a neighborhood watch. There was a gentle buzz of acceptance until a man shouted, let's just kill him, which started a back and forth between bold threats and level-headed reasoning. They eventually settled down and accepted that the police had done all they were able to do. The parents saw no other way. The plan was to buy guns, sit on the roofs in shifts until he returned, and then shoot him, dead or alive. Bang, 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 was the sound of the gavel on the bench during the alley man's trial. Before anyone had a chance to shoot him, he was arrested. He had established enough of a pattern, and when the cops caught wind of the plan, they decided to be around more than usual. Finally, something was done. The trial was fairly uneventful. A man who dad worked with was on the jury. The alley man had gone to high school with a woman down the street. He was the valedictorian of their class and apparently had a schizophrenic break in college. 
This mentally ill, supposedly medicated man lived over an hour away and was driving into town on random nights with no discernible pattern, parking at the church down the street. As the trial ended and the alley man was escorted out of the courtroom, his last words were, you think you've won, but this isn't over. Most of the charges were dropped due to lack of evidence. He was eventually released, but he never came back. In a way, he never left. I didn't hear about the block meeting or the trial or his past until years later. Our parents always tried to play it off hoping each incident would be the last. My sister and I were never given updates unless we asked. Some sort of selective amnesia allowed us to get through our youth without being constantly terrified, but we always made sure that doors and windows were locked. We jumped whenever branches brushed the glass or if animals trashed the alley. Even now I can't sleep unless my blinds are closed. Every childhood has a boogeyman. Mine just happened to be real. They told me his name. Ladies and gentlemen, Manfred Steiner, right in here!